I guess we'll uh, we'll go. Are you gonna you gonna monitor for questions? Okay. So, all right, let's get going. So, welcome everybody. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Michael Batiste. I'm the owner of Elk Calling Academy. Little backstory on me: I've been in the hunting industry for about 15 years. Uh, I have worked with companies such as Primos, Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. Um, I've been an independent consultant for call companies, and about a year ago, I started. Elk Calling Academy, and basically we do lessons, call reviews, gear reviews, tips, tutorials, all that kind of stuff. And basically, biggest thing is just trying to shorten the learning curve to help you guys find success faster out in the elk woods. I remember this is going to be my 30th year of uh, archery hunting for elk. And with you guys here tonight, we also are broadcasting live on YouTube. So one thing about my seminars you notice there's no script there's no piece of paper it's this or that it's just from experience that i've gathered over the 30 years really to help you guys the best if you've got questions or this or that fire away it's a lot more fun when it's interactive and we will be taking uh, questions from the youtube crew as well so what we're going to kind of do tonight is um tonight we're basically going to focus on more of kind of the calling technique side. And tomorrow morning, we're gonna be back here at 10 again, and then we're gonna take what we talked about tonight and go out in the field and put those into hunting applications. So hopefully we won't have to get an afternoon thunder boomer that's gonna pick our shade up because we have had that happen one year before. So, all right, so those of you that are here, who is brand new to elk, elk hunting? Perfect, okay. So, how about you guys? What's what's your experience now? Uh, I think this will be my sixth year. Okay. For bow hunting, I had it my sixth third. <clears throat> any, for elk hunting, it's just... any any success out there yet? No. Yeah. So. Nervous. So hey. But, but good offer, fun opportunities. So sixth year, yeah. the average is one every seven. Yeah. So, um, I've been extremely blessed. So what would you guys say is the number one thing that you really struggle with when it comes to archer hunting for elk? Getting them close enough. Getting them close enough. Opening okay. The doorway. Get, the get, doorway. Getting the doorway and, yeah. and those those good Getting setups. Or, okay. You know, okay. It's actually just set them up. Okay. To where they feel comfortable and okay, and then kind of understanding. Anybody struggle with the calling aspect of it? Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> Since, since, since we've done seven lessons yeah. together. <laughs> so, okay. So, diaphragms. How many of you guys can use diaphragm reads? Okay. Have you guys ever tried diaphragms? Those that have never kind of done it? Okay. Turkey. So you can run a turkey diaphragm. Yeah. Okay. How about you? What's that? Never tried it. Never tried one. Okay. <clears throat> so... So basically a diaphragm read, um, they're all pretty similar. So you, know, you have some sort of frame, which can be lightweight aluminum, it could be a heavier plastic, and they do have different sizes. So they're normally narrow, medium, and wide. So our pallets are different sizes. So it's just like if, if you normally wear a large shirt, you're not going to go into the store and start pulling shirts off the small rack. It's not going to work. So really, the, the key thing with diaphragms is since we all have different size palettes, is usually when you're starting with a diaphragm is to get a few different sizes. So, and there's a lot of different companies out there. And nice thing is, is, is you generally want to get one that's narrow, one that's medium, and then one that's wide. But also within those three, you kind of want to get a raised angle pallet plate, a dome reed, and kind of a modified dome. And what I mean by that is this, this right here is a dome reed. This is a modified dome. And then the raised angle pallet plate just has a straight plate. Because even though we have different widths on our pallets, we also have different heights. So each one is really designed a little bit different. So, 
and that what you really want to do is find that good size, that good fit, so that you get that good seal on the roof of your mouth. So a diaphragm breed is basically the flat side is the front, that just points out, the round side always points back, and that dome or whatever you have will be the top portion of the reed. So, um, now for some people, for those of you guys that have never tried a diaphragm reed, you may find a gag reflex. So, and what the gag reflex is, is the roof of our mouth, we have a hard palate, which is the front portion of the mouth, and as we go back, it starts turning into a soft palate. As soon as something contacts that soft palate, that is where that gag reflex comes in. So the nice thing about domed reeds or raised angle palate plates, they're designed to go a little farther forward. I imagine your turkey reeds, you run them pretty far back in your mouth. Uh, a little bit, yeah. So, because they're a flat conventional, they have no dome on them. Exactly. So, and honestly, guys that can run turkey diaphragms, their transition over to an elk diaphragm is pretty, pretty easy. So it's just, uh, you can still run it in the back, same place you run your turkey. It's just how your tongue contacts it and, and what you say. In it. So, okay. Now, as, as, as far as diaphragms go, there's a lot of choices out there. There's singles, there's doubles, there's triples, there's one and a halves. Well, what do, what do those mean? What that refers to is the number of latex, the layers of latex. So a single obviously has one, a double has two, and, and on up. As a beginner, you want to focus more on a single light latex because the latex also has different thicknesses and different stretches. So if you guys look for a manufacturer, you're reading the package and you see if you're a beginner and you see single light latex light stretch, that's what you want because that means it's going to take very little pressure to operate and you're going to find success a lot faster on it. Um, you know, some, some great reads for beginners. Um, this is the Rip It Red from Native by Carlton is one I recommend a lot of times for beginners. Uh, the Mellow Yellow Mama from Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls is another exceptional read for beginners. The Remedy from Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls is another really good one for beginners. Uh, Neil has all of these calls. In fact, you're running shop specials on calls and stuff, aren't you? Save a little money to get started on this. Okay, so how do we use a diaphragm? So, like I said, you, you basically want to put this with the round part back, the tab up, you put it in the mouth, and you push it up to the roof of your mouth, just almost like you're flattening out a piece of bubble gum so that your tongue's laying nice and flat on it. Now, the one thing you will want to do is a lot of people, when they first start to use a diaphragm, they'll have it sitting way out with the tip of their tongue. The only problem is tip of our tongue is really, really hard to control. So, and it flutters quite a bit and that reed can tickle. So what you want to do is you want to take that tongue and actually roll it forward and curve so the tip of the tongue is right behind your bottom teeth. That allows you to really flatten out that tongue and then flex it up. Our tongue is just like any other muscle. We can train it to flex it. We can train how much to flex it. We can control it. but just like anything else, we've got to practice with it. So, now usually when you put a reed in your mouth and you barely touch it, it's going to make kind of that low noise. You are going to feel a little bit of vibration. Now, as you flex your tongue up into it, it's just going to stair step right up. Okay. Now, the one thing to do when you first get a reed, and everybody's a little bit timid on it, they will stay on that bottom note. Go ahead and put some pressure on it. Put some pressure on it with your tongue. Take your diaphragm, force that air up, and get that high note. And then the good way to start is get that high note and then slowly relax your tongue and come down. Do that a few times. You'll get used to the control. If you hear a lot of air escaping, maybe you've got to move the reed back a little bit. So just move that reed forward and back in the roof of your mouth until you find that optimum spot. Where I like to run mine, I have the front of the call basically lined up with my premolars, which is that first tooth right behind your canine. I like to run mine back there just because that seems where it works best for me. 
Um, also, the thing is, is you maximize your air control when it's back there. But some people, as soon as they start getting back there, we get that gag reflex we were talking about, so they have to move it forward. Now, once you have that high to low, you start shortening that up. What are we starting to sound like? Cow mew. So just that little drill right there kind of teaches you a cow mew. Now what I'm doing with my air is I'm going shh and tapering off. So that's a mew, which is basic everyday communication that elk have. So as they're moving from bedding to feeding or feeding to bedding, you will hear cows and calves doing the mews and the chirps. It's their everyday communication that just says, hey, everything's all right. We're feeling good. Now the chirp portion of it, you're going to do the exact same thing. But now instead of going shh, you're just going to go shh. That's part of that everyday kind of communication that cows and calves have. Now, interesting thing with mews and chirps is this is a vocalization that elk will do with only with inside their circle. So it's just like you guys talk differently to your family and friends than you do a complete stranger, right? Same thing with elk. They have a certain communication for elk that's with inside their circle, and that's those mews and chirps that everyday kind of talk. Now, when it comes to calling elk, there is a, a mindset, there's, there's emotion in it. So just like in our language when we talk, we can say the same thing, but by adding a little bit of affliction or a little bit of emotion, it gives a different meaning. It's like when we're talking to our kids and we're like, come here, come here, come here. Okay, said the same thing, but that last time we added a little bit of emotion into it, a little bit of affliction, which kind of gave it a little bit different meaning. Same thing when calling elk. So you add a little bit different emotion or affliction and it gives that call a completely different meaning. So, okay, we talked about the basic mew. Now, you can take that basic mew and you can focus on one part or another and give it a completely different meaning. For example, if I focus on the high note, that's a lost mew just by focusing on that one different part now on the flip side if I focus on the bottom note I'm still basically doing that same mew but now by focusing on the bottom note now it kind of turns it into an assembly mew or kind of a cow saying, you know, come to me, let's, let's gather up. So um, how many of you guys run open read call calls? I noticed you came in with a couple. So you what? Okay. So for those of you that can't use diaphragms or want another option, open read cow calls are an exceptional way to go. Um, I do carry one with me all the time. It's nice because it gives a different pitch, a different tone, a different frequency, a different voice, which allows you to kind of mix things up. But also, if you're on a windy day, open read cow calls will kind of reach out and cover a little more ground. And you can do the same thing. So your mew, your chirp, lost mew, assembly, So now these are from the heritage line of native by Carlton. The neat thing about these is I've got two different voices. This is a skinny voice. This is a wide voice just to kind of show you guys. A little more volume on that wide one. The neat thing about these is they actually come in the kit with five different teeth. So the, the, the heritage line actually gives you guys the ability to get 12 different voices within that call. So you can really tailor it to the sound that you like or what you want to accomplish. Or, you know, maybe you got into an area one day and then
kind of came close, but you want to come back in the next day with just a little bit different pitch, a little bit different frequency. You can certainly, the nice thing about that kid is just pop that block out, swap the read, and then you have a completely different voice. So, okay, any questions so far? It's, it's just like anything else, guys. It's You've got to practice with it. You've got to become efficient with it. You've got to become comfortable with it. Here's the deal. There is nothing out there when you're chasing elephants that you absolutely have to be perfect on your tone and execution every single time. Um, and in fact, uh, funny, funny story, a uh, friend of mine from Nashville came out and hunting with us a few years ago. We, we had taught him how to call a little bit. And he has, he has a TV show, and he had this cameraman and his buddy with him, and they're out hunting. And they were messing around doing something. Oh, he knew. And they got this response, and they're like, that's a donkey. What is a donkey doing out here in the woods? Well, when we had driven them around and showed them, there was a horse trailer up at the top that there was a few horse trailers at. Well, they were down below that a little ways, and all of a sudden, they all started going. And these, these guys are from... Louisiana so they're not from out here at all so all of a sudden one of them goes hey remember the horse trailers are up there so they all have this image of this donkey tied up to a horse trailer on the side of the road up there and he's answering back every time they bugle well they're sitting there joking around messing with that and then all of a sudden a five by five comes trotting around the road and they're just all standing in the open can't do anything about it so they just wave the bull all of a sudden sees him turns and goes off well, they get the bright idea, hey, this will be kind of a neat thing to film for our show. So they're telling the story about this, and he cracks off a bugle, and he's like, ah, oh, that wasn't very good. Let's do it again. And about the fifth or sixth take, they get an answer. And he turns and goes, Man, that dude sucks. He is not a good caller at all. So they continue to do these takes about the donkey. They get an answer again, and he goes, Hey, that guy's getting better, but he's still not very good at all. And again, they're still in the middle of the road. Well, guess what? Second time, a bull stepped up right onto the road, but this time it was about a 350, 360-inch bull. So they <laughs> they learned pretty quick that there is none of that classic, clean, perfect. You, you will hear some bugles out there that will just make you shake your head. It's happened to me once. I, I got into a situation once I would have bet somebody $1,000 I was all intent on ruining that guy's day. So, but, so even though you don't have to be perfect, but practicing to at least have the basic structure of the different sounds and the different vocalizations will really, really benefit you out in the field. Because if you recognize what you're hearing, you understand that bull's mindset, and then you know how to kind of work that bull what to say back because each scenario is different each bull is different there is not one cookie cutter you do this on every single bull every single setup it's guaranteed success i wish it were that easy but it's not so um now we kind of we kind of touched on you know that the high to low for for cow calls and that drill Now, as far as bugling, what kind of drill that can we do? Just the opposite. Start low with that light contact. And just work on going up. Now, what that up, up and down, or what that increase.
that's basically what you're doing when you're bugle. You're just increasing and flexing your tongue and applying pressure with your diaphragm. Okay. Um, now, when it comes to, you know, we just said that there's no one perfect way or one cookie cutter way. There's a few different approaches when working with elk and calling elk. You guys can decide which style is best for you. There's an aggressive style, there's cow call only style, and then there's using cow calls to set up bugles, okay? Let me kind of put each of these into kind of human context or human interaction. That aggressive style is just like a guy walking down a sidewalk challenging every single guy he meets to a fight. Most of the guys that he just walks up and tries to fight are just going to kind of avoid him and walk around and go, what's wrong with this guy? He's got a screw loose. But then again, he may walk around the corner on a street and come up to the guy that's had a really, really bad day. Challenge accepted. That's how it is with elk. The challenge and aggressive style is a very effective style, but you have to cover a lot of ground and find that bull that is in that mindset. Now, once you find that bull that's in the mindset, man, it's, it's exciting. It's, it's a lot of fun. Okay, on the flip side, the cow call only. So my wife and I are in Las Vegas and we're walking down the street and all of a sudden we're kind of getting to that section of town where there's the ladies of the night. There's a pretty good chance that my wife is just gonna grab me by the hand, take me to the opposite side of the street and start walking the opposite direction. Same thing with cows, okay? The cows choose the bull. And once they have that bull selected, they really don't wanna share him with anybody else. So if it's not that perfect scenario, you could be sitting there just focusing on cow calls and those cows are gonna be your worst enemy and they're just gonna leave that bull right out the back door. And you're never even gonna know that they left because they'll do it quietly. Okay, third way, using cow calls to set up bugles. So best way I can describe this, my wife and I are sitting down at a, at a restaurant, we're eating dinner. A guy walks in the restaurant and he kind of starts saying hi to everybody. He looks over, he says hi, I wave back. He comes over and he sits down at our table and he starts talking to us. We're having a short, nice conversation. All of a sudden he looks at me and he goes, man, your wife is hot. I'm gonna be like, yeah, she is, I feel kind of lucky. But then he continues to say that. Well, my aggression level is going to start to rise. The next thing I know, he's completely ignoring me and he's just full on, full court press, hitting on my wife. I'm going to get to the point where I'm going to stand up and say, time out, buddy, let's go outside. This is bull crap. So that's the approach that I take hunting out. So uh, it's something that I've kind of learned and developed. And, and like I said, the, the other options, they're successful and you can be successful at those. Just the nice way about this one is it maximizes your encounter with elk. So when you get a response, you know, you're, you're doing that, that location bugle and you get a response, you can kind of gauge what type of response it is. And then as you move in and set up, you kind of start going through your sounds. Okay, what kind of response am I getting? You can all of a sudden gather that information and know are you dealing with a satellite bull that's just out by himself cruising looking for cows? Are you dealing with maybe a little more mature bull that had cows, but he just lost his cows to a more mature bull, and now he's really mad at the world? I'm dealing with a herd bull with cows, or maybe I'm dealing with a herd bull with cows with a bunch of satellites around. Because each one you're going to approach differently. You're not going to work them the same way. So, like for example, that young satellite bull. If I got set up on him and he bugled and I just hammered him with that challenge, well, he probably already got his butt kicked a time or two by other bulls. He's going to shut up and go the other way. But by me kind of recognizing what I'm dealing with and tailoring my calling approach to him, the chance of calling him in for an opportunity just went up dramatically. So now, even though we call him in for shot opportunities and they're close enough for an opportunity, these are wild animals we're dealing. Maybe they get us caught in a bad setup sometimes that there's brush or this or that, that we don't have a shot. But you know what? I'm sure you guys would be okay if you went around each day and called in five or six bulls each and every day. Didn't, didn't get a shot, but you know, you had them in the bow range. So you guys kind of chuckle, okay? Yeah, be all right.
because there's a method to my madness. So. You have a game? I do. I do. Come on, I got a whole thing back for tomorrow, too. So. Okay, so we touched a little bit on some of the cow sounds. Let's, let's kind of touch on some of the different vocals. So, okay, I, I, I called it a location bugle. There, you, if you go on to other spots online, um, other YouTube channels or this or that, you'll hear things contact you. Okay, you're going to hear a lot of different names out there. In my 30 years, I have yet to have an elk run up to me and say, Michael, this is a location bugle. They haven't given me the name of their calls. It's stuff that we put on that makes it easier to talk about. Okay, so a location bugle is just, it's a nice location. It's a nice, easy bugle. There's no big finish on it. It's basically just reaching out and saying, hey, where is everybody at? So very, very relaxed. Um, not a lot to it. When they come off at the end, they don't have a big growl. It just falls off kind of like you come over the top of a hill and slowly come down. Like I said, it's it's just a matter of reaching out and saying, hey, where is everybody? Okay, now they can start getting a little more aggressive with that call and adding aggression. The way they do is they start Ugh. with their voice. So, again, didn't get real high, there wasn't a ton of volume, but just by adding that little bit of growl at the end, you add a little bit of aggression at the end of the call. Which, you know, you, you throw out a location bugle, you get a response back with that little heavier growl. Okay, that bull is already agitated a little bit. He's already on defense, so you're immediately going, okay, what's, what's he getting defensive about? The first thing I'm going to think about is he's probably a bull that has cows, and he's already starting the aggression rise to kind of tell me to stay away. Now, what do we do once we get that locate? We move towards them, checking the wind, covering the ground, getting set up. And when I say set up, you want to be 100 yards or less when you set up. Okay, here's, here's why. So let's say you guys are, are, are with your, your wife or girlfriend or, or whatever you have. You're at one end of the parking lot. At the other end, there's somebody challenging or threatening you to a fight. At that distance, you have time to get your wife or girlfriend in the car and get her out from that situation, right? Okay, now imagine if that person is 30 yards from you. Do you still have that option to get your wife in the vehicle and get her out? So basically, it's the fight or flight mentality. When they're that close, you've eliminated the flight. There's only one option, and that's the fight. So that's why, now 100 yards, you know, we look at it as a human and we think of a football field, go, man, 100 yards, that is a lot of distance. Not if you've seen how quick a bull can cover 100 yards. That's not that far at all. So, okay. So another bugle we're going to talk about is a lip ball or display or dominance or whatever other name is, is, is out there for it. This one's a little tricky. So I'm still gonna do the same thing on the reed where I increase tongue pressure, I increase air pressure, but now I'm gonna add another element where I'm gonna take my lips and I'm gonna buzz them. Okay, it sounds something like this. Now, since this is a call that has kind of heightened aggression, a little bit more dominance to it, it is going to fall off heavy at the end. I'm falling off pretty quick and uh, I'm adding my voice really quick on it. The best way I can describe or you know, explain to you guys how to learn the lip ball, because really, especially for you guys that have never used a reed before, you're trying to get your brain to do five or six different things at one time which can be a little bit overload. So you kind of got to break it down into the different parts. The part one is controlling that reed so that you have the stair step up and you get the bugle. The second part is the puttering of the lips. And it's, it's I wouldn't say easier. I don't know, Terry, would we say easier to learn it without the reed in the mouth? It's still kind of <laughs> tough. Yeah, it's, 
So, so, but even without a reed in your mouth, while you're driving in your truck or this or that, just work on buzzing that center portion of the lips. Then once you can consecutively get that buzzing of the lips, then you go ahead and you add the reed back in. Now, the one tip I'm going to give you is as you start puttering your lips, it's going to take more air pressure. Really take your diaphragm and press that air pressure up to get that increased airflow to putter the lips. So, does that kind of make sense? Perfect. Do I get any questions yet? Do we have anybody chiming in? I see nothing. You see nothing? Come on, we got six people online with four thumbs up. <laughs> he doesn't know emoji. Yeah, 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 yeah. So modern technology. Yeah. I know. See how long it took me to set it up. So, okay. So now, ultimately, the bugle we are wanting to hear is the challenge bugle. This is the one that you have pushed this bull's button. It is very, very high pitch, and when it falls off, it falls off into a heavy growl. That is ultimately what we're, what we're wanting to get him to. So a bull is only going to come in for one of two reasons. He's either going to come in looking for love or looking for a fight. Okay. When a bull comes in looking for love, they are very, very cautious. They are really looking around. They are really, really aware of their surroundings. But when they come in looking for a fight, they're a freight train coming down the hill that they don't care if there's a tree in the way, a bush, or this or that. And it can be tough sometimes because they are, they're coming in, their nostrils are flared, their eyes are bulging, they're peeing all over themselves. And you're trying to stop them. They get into your shot window and you're, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they're just so ticked off looking for this bull to fight that man it's it, it's awesome though it will get your heart pounding that's ultimately what we try to get them to and that's you know where i talked about my wife and i in the restaurant that's kind of the approach that that, that we take tomorrow we're going to go more detail into exactly the routine that i use to accomplish that um, so you guys definitely want to come back tomorrow if you can, because that's going to be, that's really the uh, nuts and bolts of everything right there on how to use this out in the field. So, um, I know Neil, you've got, you've got shop specials on calls, mountain house, grizzly coolers. We'll do broadheads tomorrow. We'll do a broadhead test tomorrow. Told you that. Uh, dead, dead down wind. You got the you, you got the six packages. peak packages. So now is a great time, guys. That um, so with with Elk Calling Academy, we have uh, you know a YouTube channel that on every Wednesday night I do a Wapiti Wednesday Q and A, and I I do it live and it's to answer questions. And this past Wednesday we talked about uh, a checklist that you should be going through right now at this time of year to have everything ready and food was one of the things. You should already have that ready. Um, you got a pretty impressive stock of, of Mountain House in there. I don't know what you guys do for, for food in your camp. We do a lot of dehydrated meals just because, you know, we leave camp in the dark, we come back in the dark, we want something quick, simple. So a little jet foil, boil that water. Dinner's cooking while we're changing out of our camo. How many of you have had them? Well, no. They're not bad. There's, there's, yes. <laughs> I was just gonna go there. So that's aren't aren't even close. Okay, as 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 far as calling techniques, what what kind of questions do you guys have? I mean, what what were you looking to get tonight? Rock paper scissors. So, 
so most most of the open reads are the same as way the shelf is built. Okay, so they all have flat and they just kind of taper off. They have the sound channel in the middle. Okay, the so it's it's the same setup for all of them. And what she's talking about that is it, it, if you go in the middle right here, you're going to kind of get a lower tone. As you get out towards the tip, you're going to get a higher tone. Okay. Um, now notice the whole time when I was talking about cow sounds, I didn't say cow mew or calf mew or anything like that because a mew is the same. If it's lower pitched, it's a cow. If you have a higher pitch to it, it's a calf. So you can mix that up while you're calling low and high, low and high, kind of get that good mixture of cows and calves. Okay, open read cow calls, the one drawback that they have a lot of times is that the read will stick to the shell. It gets moisture buildup, it gets condensation. There's not a lot that you can do with that, except you can take a paper towel, spray it with Pam cooking spray, lightly run that between the reed and the shelf, and that will help it. I'm not gonna say eliminate the sticking, it's still going to stick some, but that is one thing that Native actually did that's kind of cool on their heritage line is this is a textured soundboard. So it has dimples on it, so you don't have that flat surface for that reed to come against. So, so that's what's kind of neat about this. You have the textured board, the five different voices, with the O-ring or without, so really you can do 12 different combinations you know, on that line. So, okay, that answer your question on the open reed? Yeah. Okay. So when do you know it's gonna be uh, assembly? So, come back tomorrow and we'll talk about it. So, no, so the, the assembly mew, you know, like I said, that's that's just, okay, so the lost mew we're gonna use when we're locating. Okay, and we'll get into this deeper kind of tomorrow morning. The assembly mew, once I set up, so the very first part of it, I start with a long mew, assembly mew, and demanding mew, and then I start adding new elements each time I come around. So basically what I'm doing is I'm painting the picture of a breeding sequence that is basically a bull that has a hot cow. So, and tomorrow I'll paint that whole picture. I'll walk you, I'll, I'll open it up and walk you through the whole gambit with all the sounds and how to do them and how long to wait in between and all that stuff. See, I got to dangle the carrots. So you'll, you'll cover the estrus call then. Let's talk about that. Yeah. You're talking about the estrus buzz, yeah. right? Yeah. The buzz mule. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, we're gonna go on this tonight because there's a lot of controversy on this sound. So, okay, for years we have actually heard the terms buzz mu, estrus buzz, hyper hot, all that, right? Okay. So what this is referring to is a cow is only in estrus for 12 to 24 hours. It's a very very short window, and this is why I say that there's a lot of controversy on this sound. Because for years we only called it the buzz mew or the estrus mew because we were only hearing that during September, right? So it's gotta be associated with the estrus, it has to be. Well, a couple of years ago, I went into my bear bait in June, first part of June. I had a group of cows and calves on my bait. I walked around the rock, I, they scared me just as much as I scared them. They scattered all different directions. I swapped out the cards on my trail cam, climbed up in my tree, and about 30 minutes later, I hear a cow coming up the ridge behind me. She's doing the buzz mute. Highly doubt she's in estrus on June 1st. So... So I really started to think and started to go back and watch a lot of videos. And one video in particular, um, <clears throat> we were in Colorado and we got into a group of elk and we could tell that there was a hot cow. Because a cow won't make any noise when she comes into estrus. Okay, she's gonna release pheromones in the air. That bull's constantly going around scent check in the air. That's how he knows when a cow comes into estrus. So if you really think about deer, does a doe really make noise when she comes in or does she squat and pee and that buck runs up sniffs and then he knows it's time to breed same thing with elk but when that cow is towards the tail end 
of her estrus cycle. And when there's a cow in estrus, it creates a lot of excitement. That it's not only bulls bugling, but it's cows and calves, mews and chirps. There is a lot of noise. So by right, she would have to do some sound that would separate her above and from everything else, right? That's actually what I think this buzz mew is. I think it's more of a, a pay attention to me now type call. So um, you can actually go online to YouTube. Row Hunting Resources has a video. I think it's um, um, Barks, Bugles, and more or something like that. It, cow barks, bugles, and more. And it's a cow during June that is separated. And you can tell she's panicking. She's running around. There's a lot of urgency with the estrus, and she will start doing this buzz mute. So, so honestly, that's my take on it. There's a couple of others out there that we we kind of feel the same way about that sound. So, I feel like it's a panic. Well, not a panic. It's it's more of a sound to separate them that is demanding attention. But the, in the case where you saw him in June so, doing that. Because she was, she was basically, she was doing it with lost muse, with frustrated whines, and basically, you know, she's doing a sound that is demanding attention. Uh -huh. So, you know, nobody's answering her lost muse. Nobody's, she, she's getting frustrated, so she's throwing that out. Well, in September, when she's coming to the end of her rut, and you have all this... You know, you have mews and chirps and all this noise going on. She breaks into that call that is louder than anything else. All of a sudden, that bull hears that. He knows. I need to pay attention to that. She's asking for attention. So so I think it's more of that sound that's just demanding attention. And had I not ever heard it during June, I still would be saying, yeah, that's that's that estrus, estrus scream that they do right when they're at the tail end of the rut. So, so honestly, that's kind of what, what I think it is. So, so in general, how this a little more tomorrow? Oh, absolutely. So, because there's, there's other theories that go along with that. There's theories for a lot of things. On the estrus? It, it is a short cycle. They are only in estrus. Mm -hmm. And if they haven't been bred and they know that they're coming towards the end of that cycle, that's when they start doing this really pay that's attention when to they me get now. Really panicky or they they re come here big boy yep now the, the the thing is you know we touched on that 12 to 24 hour on their cycle if they're not bred they will actually come back into cycle again roughly 14 to 21 days later and depending on the cow they can have up to up to three cycles throughout the year so you know the autumn equinox is what really triggers the rut that is the equal amount of daylight and darkness that hits the cow's eyes that's what triggers triggers the rut this year it falls on september 22nd okay most cows are bred within a seven to ten day window of that autumn equinox now where exactly that autumn equinox falls within that seven to ten days varies year to year the autumn equinox could be the end of it it could be in the middle of it it could be the start of it but it varies well what factors could cause that to shift or adjust the upcoming winter? So because of the gestational period of the calves, those cows know that they can, they can feel it. They know if there's a bad winter coming, so they will push their rut later so that they have time to drop the calves. When springtime is broke, there's the flush grasses, the plush new grasses that are grown. There's a lot of nutrients. They need that for producing milk. Now, on the flip side, if they feel it's going to be a mild winter, you may see that rut shift a little earlier because then they're going to drop the calves earlier in spring, which just gives those calves more time to grow and get bigger for that next winter coming up. So, so usually, how do I pick what's the best week to hunt? Yeah, we'll go ahead and hit on this tonight. First thing I do is I pull up the on Google and I'll pull up the autumn equinox. I want to know when that's hitting. Second thing I'm going to pull up is the moon phase because I want to know what the moon is doing around the autumn equinox. And then thirdly, I will do a Google search for winter prediction 2018-2019 just to see what it's going to do. So this year we have autumn equinox on September 22nd. We have an increasing moon leading up to that with a full moon on the 25th. 
and the winter prediction is western Idaho is a normal year, eastern Idaho is an extremely above normal year, and same thing with here a little bit into western Wyoming. So, how accurate is it? How many of you have ever used the moon phaser? That lunar thing. I, I would have never a white white tail guy. I, I've seen yeah, some things in the last three years. I'm a believer. I went out and bought GPS and followed that moon phase pretty religiously. And we'll we'll talk more about how those kind of affect, you know, the different different activities throughout the year. So, did you have a, another question to leap off of that? Uh, so, is the full moon when they're when it's the best, or is it? Uh, that is personal preference. Okay. The full moon, they are definitely more active at night with the full moon. But you got to understand that just because it's a full moon doesn't mean that they are running around nonstop all night long. They are running around more, but they will still bed down a little bit and then get back up. Now, during a full moon, because they've done more activity than normal at night because it's brighter, they will go to bed sooner. And they'll stay in bed and come out later in the evening. But what do you think happens during that midday time? They get restless, they get up, the bulls coming out and check them. And unfortunately, a lot of people, and I've heard this for years, as soon as they hear full moon, they're like, great. It's only going to be going to be good the first hour of light and the last hour of light. So we might as well just go out and do a half-hearted hunt and then go back to camp and play cards until it's time to go out for the last hour. Me, I'm like, perfect. Good. Go for it. Have fun. Good luck on your poker. I'm staying out here. I leave camp in the dark. I come back in the dark. And the nice thing is, yeah, they go to bed early. Well, you can work the fringes of those bedding areas and be far enough away that your scent is fine. But that midday time, you are right there that as soon as that bull gets up and starts checking cows. Because, I mean, it's not like they go into a bedding area and they lay all lay down in an area this big. No, they could be spread out 60, 70 yards, and that bull's just cruising, checking all those cows. So especially around that time where it's autumn equinox, where majority of the cows come into estrus, he's going to be up and checking them a lot more. Because remember, they don't the cows don't make sound. He's checking them in. So if you're close by, you can take advantage of that midday time. So so again, it's it's personal preference on the on the full moon. I don't mind full moon time. They will. They always have. They always have backup areas. Yep. And that's why, you know, I I don't like to hunt bedding areas. I'll hunt the fringes. I learned a while ago that if you keep the elk in your area in their normal pattern as much as you can, they're still going to be there day after day after day. But if you go in and you bust them out of the bedding area, the chances of them coming back into that bedding area, they may not even be back at all that season. They may not come back to that until the following year. So now if it's towards the tail end of the season and I've only got a couple of days left, what's it going to hurt if I go in there and hit, hit that? But most of the time, first part of season, mid-season, I just hunt the fringes of bedding areas. So any other questions? Do we got anything online? That's a quiet Nine group. And five. Nine and five. Any thumbs down yet? Oh, here's one. So, so with the GPS, are you, are you using like on like on my GPS? It goes it shows what, the best GPS. times, the good times of the day. I mean, do you? What do you? What's your opinion on that? Because I'm always like, oh, it's the best. It's eight thirty in the morning till so eleven o'clock. It's like, really? You know, I I don't know because I've. I've seen it's where it's supposed to be an excellent day, yeah. and I've had horrible activity, yeah. and I've seen poor days that were some of the best I've ever had. Yeah. So it's been my experience. I'm like, I don't know if there was just. Yeah. Okay, come and show me your technology because there was a question. Then it disappeared. Great info. You're right. Nobody was saying anything. Ming is making the audio. All right, we'll put the uh, 
We'll put the uh, mic cover on, so hopefully that will help. Oh, you said there was a question. I thought there was a question. I'm here. I'm listening. Great info and a great guy to learn. Who do I owe money to for that? <laughs> oh, I know who that is. So, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean that that whole major minor deal. I, I I've never really put much emphasis on it. So, um, especially because so let's kind of talk about the different seasons of you know the elk and the rut and this and that. So, you know, you have the early season, which is August 15th to roughly August 30th, okay? So, most of the summer, cows and calves and younger bulls are living at lower elevations where there's good grass, there's good water, there's good protection. The bulls are either living solo up high, usually at tree line or above, or they're in bachelor groups, okay? This early season time, August 15th to August 30th, those bachelor groups start breaking up into solo groups. They start rubbing the velvet off, they start getting hard horn, they start establishing their pecking order, and they start thinking about cows. Okay, now we have the pre-rut, which is, you know, kind of that end of August to not quite midpoint of September yet. So that's the pre-rut. Now these bulls are coming down, they're rounding up the cows, they're getting their harems put together, and they're starting to break up into their rutting activity or, or their rutting areas. So a bull will go back to the same rutting area year after year after year after year. So, um, so they're gathering, they're working in. Now, you kind of get this lull towards the tail end of this pre-rut where you can't buy a bugle. You've had pretty decent bugling action where they've been establishing their packing order. You've had pretty good bugling action when they've been rounding up their cows. But now you get a few days in there where, like I said, you can't buy a bugle. Anybody know why? They're all waiting for a cow to come in cycle. So they've done everything to gather their herds. They got all their cows. Now they're basically just feeding, waiting, because they know as soon as the cows start coming into estrus and cycle, it's going to be a lot of energy. It's a lot of energy checking all those cows. It's a lot of energy breeding them. It's a lot of energy protecting those cows from other bulls trying to come in and take them. Okay, after, after that pre-rut, now we get into the peak rut, which is when cows start coming into estrus, usually middle of September through the end of September. There's good, good bugling action. Now, the funny thing is with this, and I hear this all the time, see if you guys that have been out there hunting, you go into an area one day and bulls are just screaming. And you're like, God, this place is hot. You come back in the next day and it's absolutely quiet. Again, why? Because you're 12 to 48 hours and you're tired? Because the day before you went in there, there was a hot cow. Then you come back the next day, there's not a hot cow anymore. So they excitement level will go up and down as well just so like i said because those bulls their scent check and that creates a lot of excitement and so tomorrow when we get in the breeding sequence what we're kind of doing with that breeding sequence is we're basically fooling those elk around us that we're a bull that has a hot cow and we're trying to create that breeding sequence that excitement that environment so okay after the peak rut we have the post rut which is you know October 1st, October 15th, um, you know, that's when you get a few cows kind of still coming into cycle. And that's why you'll hear rifle hunters sometime middle of October that are like, oh man, the bulls were screaming their heads off in a canyon. We had a great day. Well, it's because you had some, some cows that didn't get bred the first time. I mean, bulls are pretty efficient. They normally get it done the first time around, but there's still some that fall through the cracks and then they come in middle of October. Okay, then you have the late season which is from mid-October on through. And at this time, the cows and younger bulls are kind of staging, getting ready to start migrating to their winter grounds. The bulls are now gathering back up into their bachelor groups and heading back up to, so it's almost a complete opposite. The pre-rut, or, or, or the early season and late season are almost identical, but just pure, pure opposite, if that makes sense. So early season, they were in a group and disbanding. Late season, they're solo and gathering back up. 
So bulls will go up to the high country and they'll spend all winter up at the high country. So they don't necessarily always migrate. As long as they have enough cover and they have enough feed and they have a place to water in a small little area, they'll stay up in the high country all winter long. How do you it, identify a rutting area? So a, a rutting area, um, you know, if you've, got a, if you've got an area with a lot of wallows, a lot of rubs, so, and I'm not talking rubs that are in a rub line. So what I'm talking about, and you know this from whitetails, you have a rub line. So when a bull is traveling from bedding to feeding, you can stand there and you can look down the trail and you can see where he's hitting certain trees on the way down. That is telling me that's a transitional route. Because if it's a bedding area, you will have a wallow and you can do a 360 degree turn and there's trees in this circle all tore up around this wallow. That's an area he's hanging out. When they rub, they're putting scent on the tree. So, absolutely. So, so yeah, rubs, rubs and wallows. So, and tomorrow we'll uh, we'll kind of talk about scouting and what I look for, scouting. And guys, I could I could sit here and we could stay here for several hours, and throw all kinds of useless information at you. But we got to save some for tomorrow. What time is it? Seven. Okay. So, what other questions? As far as just the elk calling in general, you know, or the, the elk hunting in general, ah. uh, just because I'm just new to the game. Right. So. Well, I mean, there could be other people that have the same questions, so if sure. you want to start firing them, but yeah. what about? So last year, we hunt together all season. Last year, we kept running into a solo cow the whole mm -hmm. season. I mean, we usually have them both have three or four tags within the field. You have cow calf, and, and so we're like, well, there's an opportunity maybe. How do you, how would you approach like a, like you just keep popping into one, and if I'm sure it's the same cow, you know, that you've got disbanded from your group? You know, you know, it could be a few different things. So you will sometimes, and in fact, if, if you put trail cameras up and run trail cameras during the summer, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting because you, you, you can find kind of different dynamics. And I don't know if you've ever seen this where you may get cows and calves coming in in one group, but then you may get another group that are cows only. There's not a single calf with them, but they're not with that other group. Well, why? Well, it could be a lot of factors. They could have aborted the calf during the winter because it was a harsh winter. Maybe they just didn't get bred, could be a dry cow. Do you feel your scent, if you walk through an area, do you feel that your scent gets left there? So it it does. And, and, uh, here you go, Michael. Okay. He's a rosy hunter. Uh-oh. Okay. So this might not apply, but how do you determine what or where a bedding area is? What or where a bedding area is. So usually you will know it's a bedding area because you will have some really, really churned up dirt. It'll be really powdery. And you will see beds. So usually it's going to be in darker timber, and usually there are a major trail coming into it that's turned up and a major trail leaving from it. So you have your entrance and your exit to the bedroom. Now, how big is that bedding area? It can, it can vary. It could be a 10 by 10, or I mean, it could be an 80 by 80, depending on the size of the herd. You will also know it's a bedding area because it will have that very strong musky elk smell to it because they spend a lot of time in there. So if you walk in, you find churned up dirt, strong smell, and you see the body impressions of elk laying down, that's, that's the bedding area. So, okay, get back to dropping scent. So, yeah, I do think you leave a little bit of scent every time you go in. Um, and in fact, um, I've, I've seen bulls, um, you know, come across a trail that we had walked in on and drop their head immediately and start Whoa. sniffing the boot prints. When are you going to cover the racking movement? That tomorrow the deal? The racking movement. Raking. Oh, raking? <laughs> just when it ends. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm just reading the words on the screen. Oh. Yeah, tomorrow the raking will all be part of the setup with uh, um, that breeding sequence. Nope. So. Now we changed it. Oh. Raking? raking. Okay.
So. So how do you feel about wolves? There's so. <laughs> quite a bit of predators in the area. Will elk sound off? Hold that thought. Let me finish this one real quick. Okay. How rude. Um, <laughs> I know I asked you guys to ask questions and then she does and I got to cut her off. So, um, no, but trail cameras can be really, really effective. But here's the deal. I run trail cameras even in an area that I've hunted for 20 years because I want to know that they're still in the same pattern. But the thing is, is I only go in and I check that camera every three weeks or every four weeks. I'm not in there every single week. And the other thing is, is I don't go in with my laptop or card reader and pull the SD card and I don't sit right there and do it. I am, I've got all the information I need and I don't want them hanging out there with an increased number of people that could stumble across them during you know, hunting season and mess with them. So I have enough bears that mess with one of my cameras. I don't need people messing with it too. So, all right, wolves. So since the introduction of wolves, I have definitely seen a change within bulls and the way they call and the way they rut. So the days of old of, you know, elk coming out and coming to the point on a ridge and ringing a canyon with a bugle is done. We won't see it. Thing I have seen is instead of breeding and doing a lot of this activity out in the wide open like they used to, they're now doing it in the thicker timber. I've also noticed too that they have kind of turned down the volume a little bit on some of their bugling. Because the thing you got to understand is in heavy timber, it knocks that sound down. It's not going to travel as far. So they get in heavy timber. They're not as loud, the heavy timber. So you might have to be in some areas, you might have to be within 100, 150 yards before you can hear some of these guys bugle if it's really, really thick. So now to kind of um, add on that, if I get into an area and I hear wolves, I don't necessarily leave the area because if wolves are in the area, it means elk are in the area. So now the elk may, you know, we are now with enough generations of elk growing up with wolves that they have learned how to do It's not the same elk we had in the 90s when, when wolves were first introduced. So they definitely know how to evade and change and kind of coexist a little bit. But there still is that predator to prey dynamics that. You don't hear a lot of bugling. Have you been in that situation? No, I've actually heard it where I had been working a bull and as soon as a wolf starts howling. So, but. I've also seen those elk go really quiet, slip out the bottom side, up over the ridge, down back the other side, and start bugling again. In fact, uh, last year, the area we hunted, um, new area, we, we did a pretty good loop the first day, and the higher up the mountain we got, the less deer and elk tracks that we saw. But the more... Oh, I'm about, about to die. Okay, guys, it's about to die. Um, if you're in the area, get to Archer Unlimited at Nawan.